Hello, I'm Gavin Nyman. I'm an orthopedic surgeon specialising in shoulder, elbow and hand surgery. I've been asked by a general practitioner to talk about fractures that occur around the hand and wrist, and in particular, what the options are for treatment. This request isn't unusual, as I always recall one of my general practitioners coming to me while I was working in Scotland and suggesting that there's no reason to x-ray a hand, as no one ever treated a fracture of the finger anyway. Nothing could be further from the truth. I think the difficulty with hand and wrist fractures is the diagnosis. Whilst working with the SNFL football club, I always, was always surprised by the fact that what seemed like a simple sprain to the hand with a player stating he just injured or bruised his hand and there was nothing to worry about, often turned out to be a fracture which would have been missed if not x-rayed. This doesn't mean that every person who has an injury requires an x-ray, but one needs to be suspicious as these fractures can be easily missed. Certainly injuries that involve dislocation of finger joints which need relocation or if there's any story of distortion, I believe requires an x-ray. We also need to be aware that during child's development, for the first 15 to 18 years, the bones are the weak link in the chain, and fractures are more common. So what are the common fractures that we see? Well, everyone's aware of the scaphoid fracture that occurs after a fall. This is the bone that's actually the drive shaft of the wrist, and links the eight bones of the wrist is joined together. It has poor blood supply, and if fractured or broken, has less healing potential. It often presents with pain in the anatomical snuff box, but pain can be felt at the scaphoid tubercle, but generally around the radial side of the wrist, and it's often best diagnosed with an x-ray. If any clinical suspicion is present, then a repeat x-ray of the two-week mark is appropriate. In fact, all fractures that may not show up initially may take several weeks to show, and therefore if any significant trauma occurs, sometimes it's safer to treat the patient with a splint or a removable brace, with a follow-up x-ray 10 to 14 days later. Scaphoid fractures, if undisplaced, are often treated without an operation or with cast immobilization. But if there's any displacement, distortion to the alignment or require wrist patients, these can be easily treated with a screw placed on the skateboard to stabilise the fracture. And there's growing evidence this is a good thing to do. We all are aware that the skateboard is at higher risk of avascular necrosis after a fracture and that the bone's blood supply can die off, leaving the bone dying. The real issue is not this, but more the fact that the fracture doesn't heal in the correct alignment or does not heal at all, and this can lead to undue forces being placed at the risk, leading to secondary osteoarthritis. With all injuries, but particularly the scaphoid, healing is affected by smoking, and in all patients, we encourage the person not to smoke. There are other fractures which can occur around the scaphoid, which can look like a scaphoid fracture, and these involve the radiostoloid at the end of the radius, which is often displaced and may require screw fixation. Other injuries in this area include the tear of the ligament between the scaphoid and the lumen. This ligament joins the two bones together, and if torn, can lead to arthritis. If there's any concern about a tear of the ligament, then an MRI scan may be warranted. But although in general practice, this can be quite hard to order. With all injuries, the goal is to restore the bone to the correct alignment or the ligaments to the correct position to allow for healing. On occasions, I'll see an older patient which has some concern about a scapegoat fracture due to pain in the anatomical snuff box. But this is a common presentation. It often is just a flare-up of osteoarthritis of the scapho, trapezial, trapezoid joint, or the carpal metacarpal joint, which are the joints underneath the, th the thumb. In these cases, often a fracture is excluded by following up with serial x-rays, or a CT scan may have been undertaken to exclude the fracture. But when it's been excluded, then the treatment involves a treatment of the arthritis, which may even involve a steroid injection. When it comes to finger fractures, these can involve the metacarpals or the phalanges. Fractures of the shaft or, or the distal aspect of the metacarpal can involve some angulation, the most common finger being affected being the little finger. A common cause is when someone punches a wall, or even when there's a punching and someone punches someone's face. If it involves a punching of the face, it may involve a tooth mark on the hand, and this implies that a penetrating injury has occurred. And this runs a risk of leading a septic arthritis in the metacarpal phalangeal joint. Assuming there's no wound and there's purely angulation of bone, the amount of angulation that can be accepted depends on the actual digits involved. With a little finger, it can be up to 40 degrees of flexion would be appropriate. When it comes to index finger, only half of this amount is acceptable, being aware that all the rays of metacarpals angulate to some degree. These fractures often heal very quickly because of the amount of blood supply. The other type of metacarpal fracture is those that involve the base, typically the base of the ring or little finger, often occurring after a fall or after a punch injury. These are difficult to visualise, but often are seen on the lateral x-ray showing some dorsal subluxation with the dorsal lip of the hamate being displaced. They're easily, easily missed, and a CT scan of the region can demonstrate these nicely. Fractures at the base of the thumb are often known as the Bennett type fracture. It can also lead to thumb subluxing and incongruity of the joint surface. If there's any distortion of the joint surface at the base of the thumb, or if there's any significant angulation either on the shaft or neck of the metacarpal, 
or if there's displacement of the metacarpal base, then further reductions can be undertaken and may require an anaesthetic in either pin fixation or placing screws being inserted. That being the case, most hand fractures can compensate quite well for anatomical disturbance because of the hyperextensibility of all the digits. When it comes to the digits themselves, what we're looking for is the alignment or rotation, checking that the fingers don't overlap when making a fist, or there's no excessive extension or flexion of the phalanges, otherwise a compensatory deformity may cough the finger can develop. If a fracture is in an appropriate position, and the alignment is not significantly displaced either medially or laterally, volar or dorsally, and there's no rotational deformity on making a fist, then the digits are best treated by buddy taping them together, and then putting them in a slint so as to immobilize the fingers, palm and wrist going up to the forearm. If there's any malalignment, then they are best treated by surgery, and often will involve either K being inserted into the phalangeals to stabilize them, or putting it in a cross manner, or even putting in screws and plates. Probably the most common fracture that I see is the mallet finger, which is a disruption of the extensor tendon when the tendon is pulled off the distal phalanx, often with a chip of bone. This presents with a difficulty straightening the finger, and is easily treated by an extension split, holding in, in extension for six weeks. The tendons either heal up or the surrounding fibers do the job. Surprisingly, even if this diagnosis is missed, treatment with the same technique at a later date with an extension split seems to work really well. The important thing is using an extension split 100% of the time. Even when taking it off to wash the hand, the finger has to be held straight so as not to allow any flexion, otherwise it stops the healing. If the chip of the bone, however, is quite large, it can lead to some subluxation of the distal phalanx on the middle phalanx, and this is quite important because it leads, can lead to a higher risk of arthritis. In this situation, this fracture needs to be reduced with a KY and often the joint reduced by stabilizing it with a wire across the joint. These are, there are a myriad of fractures that can occur around the hand and wrist, and this is just a small subset emphasizing the importance of what can occur. It's really important to make the diagnosis, look for any abnormal alignment or subluxation or disruption ligaments, and if there's any concern at all, always feel free to refer to an orthopedic hand surgeon. I hope this information is of use. Thank you very much for your time. And if you found this information useful, please remember to like or share the video so others can appreciate it too. Thank you very much.